quickly I realized um, that this was first of all an issue that was widely misunderstood. People had seen tax havens as a kind of exotic sideshow to the global economy. My definition is really just two words. The first word is escape and the second word is elsewhere, somewhere else. In other words, you take your money somewhere else to escape the rules and laws that you don't like. That's the essence of a tax haven. This is a phenomenon that is everywhere. It's all around us. Every company that we use, every, you know, anything, you know, milkshake that you drink, if it's made by a well-known company, it will be, that milkshake will somehow have a connection with tax havens. So what you have, sort of generically, this whole system um, inevitably creates an escape route for the richest section of society um, from laws and rules that they don't like. Whereas everybody else who's just behaving normally, who's not, doesn't have the same opportunity to use tax havens, um, is having to obey those rules, is having to pay those taxes. How much money is in tax havens? There's various different measures. They range between um, 7 trillion and about 40 trillion US dollars um, uh, is in tax havens. Now, if you were to take that many dollar bills and put them end to end, you would have um, uh, a line of dollar bills that stretches several times along the Earth's orbit around the sun. I do not see the, the, the fight against tax havens as a leftist fight. This is not a left-right fight. This is about the corruption of markets. This is about crime. This is about democracy. You know, tax havens are undermining democracy. They are increasing criminality. They are undermining the integrity of markets. Thank you for your time. Could you introduce yourself, describe what the Tax Justice Network is, and tell us what personally inspired you to pursue this topic? Okay, um, I'm a journalist, a freelance journalist. I write mostly about economic and political matters, particularly kind of dirty money, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I work part-time for the Tax Justice Network, um, and the Tax Justice Network really is two things. One is about tax, and, and how to make tax systems more accountable, more progressive, so that effectively the poor pay less and the rich pay more, um, that kind of thing. Um, the other side of the tax justice network is to look at the international tax system and particularly tax havens. And tax havens, this goes much beyond tax. It's, it's, uh, tax is an important part of it, but it involves secrecy, it involves financial regulation. Um, so it's a very broad kind of field. So I started out in this area. I used to write about oil and politics in West Africa and the corruption, and I always saw money flowing out to tax havens, and that was kind of the end of my investigations because of the secrecy. I couldn't really find out what happened after the money left. Um, but I was approached by somebody called John Christensen, uh, who used to be the economic advisor to the big British tax haven of Jersey. And he had kind of turned against tax havens. And he had set up an organization, this was the Tax Justice Network, set up in 2003, um, that was dedicated to campaigning against tax havens. And he'd seen my experiences in Africa and had realized that, that some of the things we were writing about were quite similar. And we started talking uh, in about 2007, and quickly I realized um, that this was, first of all, an issue that was widely misunderstood. People had seen tax havens as a kind of exotic sideshow to the global economy. Um, um, but also people hadn't realized how big it was. Um, I realized that the biggest tax havens in the world um, included my own country, the United Kingdom, which runs a network of tax havens around the world. Um, the United States is a huge tax haven. Germany is a big tax haven in important respects. So I realized that people hadn't, you know, the, the widespread perception of tax havens was wrong. And I was instantly fascinated and hooked and I started working with John very soon after that and we started developing this kind of critique along with some other people um, of the whole tax haven system looking at it from an economic perspective it's not just about criminals and mafiosi it's much bigger than that all the world's multinationals are in tax havens all the world's richest people use tax havens um, so so yeah that I, I, I once I understood, once John had shown me how important and how strange the system was, I was hooked and I've, I've worked on tax havens ever since. You mentioned that Germany is a tax haven. That would be surprising to many people here. Could you be more specific about this claim? Yeah, it might help to start with what the definition of a tax haven is. Um, there's no 
dis there's no general agreement on what a tax haven is. There's lots of definitions out there. But for me, it's, uh, it's really two things. And I, my definition is really just two words. The first word is escape. And the second word is elsewhere, somewhere else. In other words, you take your money somewhere else to escape the rules and laws that you don't like. That's the essence of a tax haven. Those laws might be tax laws. They might be disclosure rules. They might be transparency rules. Um, you might be looking for secrecy. They might be financial regulations. You can go to another place and you won't be subjected to your home financial regulations. So tax havens are all about offering escape routes. Um, now, in Germany's terms, there, is, there are lots of things in Germany's laws that allow foreigners, people outside of Germany, to send their money into Germany. And once it's in Germany, information about their holdings isn't going to go back to their home countries. So if, for example, uh, someone from Tanzania or Morocco buys some German real estate, um, there have been laws um, and there are laws in Germany that enable that person to invest the money in a way that their own tax authorities will never know that they have that money in Germany. Um, and that, so that's lack of information flowing in the other direction is a problem um, for those countries. Um, and so that's what makes Germany a tax haven. It is, it is a very large, um, uh, very large player in the system, actually. I think most people don't regard Germany as a tax haven, um, but uh, in important respects it is. Could you define and differentiate some terms for us, specifically tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions? In addition, could you let us know how they have historically functioned up until the current period? There is a kind of global system of offshore tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions, and each one offers a different thing. Um, it's like a sort of ecosystem with lots of different evolutionary niches. So. Uh, a tax haven like um, the British Virgin Islands, for example, it specializes in offering shell companies and trusts, offshore trusts, that provide very strong secrecy um, and a few other things. And so companies will put, or people will put um, assets in the British Virgin Islands, um, or companies will set up um, structures there that allow them to use those particular um, secrecy laws. Um, there may be uh, financial regulation if bank wants to escape financial regulation. So um, for decades, American banks, for example, have been coming to London um, to do things that they're not allowed to do at home. They've been using London as a kind of escape route from particular financial regulations. It's been going on particularly since the 1970s um, uh, and maybe even earlier. Um, American banks have been subjected to, you know, quite strong regulations historically. And so they've used London as an escape route. So there's a kind of offshore thing going on there. So, um, and London offers many other things. Um, so each jurisdiction offers a, a whole mixture of different, different facilities. And there's this kind of constant, what they call competition going on between them. So if the British Virgin Islands sets up a, a, a you know, a very strong law about, um, you know, if you set up a BVI company, you can get very strong secrecy. Then another jurisdiction will look at that and then will say, OK, we can do something even better. It's even harder for the tax authorities to break and um, we'll set up something even stronger. And so and that kind of competition, this constantly trying to attract the money by creating more more sort of devious and, and problematic um, uh, facilities is kind of driving the whole the whole system forward. So it's a kind of um, it's a constant process of evolution. In the other direction, you have kind of democracy pushing back. So you have international, you know, countries get together to try and tackle this kind of stuff and um, international organizations try and tackle this stuff. So on the one hand, the tax havens are kind of getting worse. And on the other hand, democracy is trying to push back. And that's kind of where we're at at, at, at the moment. Which tax havens are the most significant? Where are they based? And how much money is hidden in these places? You, you can look at this different ways um, where the most important tax havens are. Um, if you're looking at wealthy individuals and secrecy, um, you know, where are wealthy individuals putting their money um, to hide it, you will find obviously Switzerland has always been a very important tax haven. It has improved to a certain degree in recent years, but it is still a big tax haven. Um, the United States is a very big tax haven. You can send lots of wealthy people are putting their money in the United States and whether it's using a, a Delaware corporation um, or using US banking laws, 
they can put their money and hide it from their own country's tax authorities or criminal authorities um, and uh, get away with it. And there, there's no way to kind of penetrate that stuff. So particularly for weaker countries, weaker countries, the tax authorities cannot go to the United States and find, find out what's going on or cannot go to Switzerland and find out what their taxpayers are doing. Um, if it's a stronger country, if it's a, a, a US citizen putting their money in Switzerland, then because of the power of the United States, they, might, they, they find it easier to get, the United States tax authorities find it a lot easier to get the money out of Switzerland. But if Tanzania goes to Switzerland, says we want this information, they'll just say get lost, you know, we don't care about you. So there's a whole kind of power play going on. So that's wealthy individuals. There are also corporate tax havens. Um, and the biggest corporate tax havens in the world are generally Switzerland, Luxembourg, um, the Netherlands, Ireland, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, these places offer generally tax loopholes. Um, you can, a corporation can set up a sub subsidiary in Luxembourg and achieve all sorts of things and particularly escape paying tax on whatever it wants to do. And quite often these places are sort of pathways through the international tax system. So if a multinational from Germany invests in China, for example, it might root, root its corporate structure through a tax haven or two tax havens or three tax havens in order to carefully escape the, the places where it's going to have to pay tax and it will pay, it will tend to pay less tax as a result. How much money is in tax havens? There's various different measures. They range between um, 7 trillion and about 40 trillion US dollars um, uh, is in tax havens. It's a very imprecise um, study, partly because of the secrecy, but partly because there's no generally agreed definition of what a tax haven is. Um, but, you know, that much money, if you take, you know, if you were to take that many dollar bills and put them end to end, you would have um, uh, a line of dollar bills that stretches several times along the Earth's orbit around the sun. So we're talking about absolutely huge amounts of money. Um, this is not the stuff that, you know, the traditional images of money sitting in a suitcase and being taken across borders. This is obviously much bigger than that. It's, it's, we're talking really gigantic amounts of money sitting offshore. How do researchers like you compute the amount of money that is hidden in these havens when they are secret by nature? Could it be that they contain even more money than has been uncovered by your research so far? Well, I think that, I mean, the ways of tracking this stuff down, there are international statistics that allow you to get some sort of handle on it. Um, I think uh, th there could be more in tax havens in the sense that the ways that you measure it um, may uh, understate the problem um, because there are huge amounts of money. I mean, I gave a figure of between seven and, and $30 trillion kind of in tax havens. Um, there are also much bigger flows through tax havens. I mean, the, the Netherlands, for example, sees, I, don't, I can't remember the figure, but it's about $10 trillion um, a year flowing through these kind of Netherlands conduit companies. So, um, you know, there are much <laughs> bigger numbers kind of involved in tax havens, not necessarily sitting in tax havens. But it's kind of a tricky, you know, you have to define your terms very carefully when you're talking about this and you have to, you know, you have to sort of nail it down. But I think it's fair to say that every multinational company in the world has uh, subsidiaries in tax havens. There are some multinationals that have um, hundreds of subsidiaries. I was looking at a US bank the other day and it had um, nearly 900 subsidiaries in tax havens. Um, so this is a phenomenon that is everywhere. It's all around us. Every company that we use, every, you know, anything, you know, milkshake that you drink, if it's made by a well-known company, it will be, that milkshake will somehow have a connection with tax havens. Um, you know, the apartments we live in, if we're renting from a big landlord, they will almost certainly be using tax havens as well. Um, so it, it, it's everywhere. Can we somehow avoid being part of tax havens? What class of people that we should be aware of make use of such havens? I think, again, it's a question of degree. I think if you want to completely avoid touching tax havens at all, you have to go and live in a cave because it's, it's everywhere. Um, or live in a hut in a forest and grow your own food. Um, but I think there are many ways to minimize this that's going on. Um, I think most people earn a living, pay their taxes on it, and they don't really have any direct 
personal responsibility for what they're doing. It's generally wealthier people who take an active decision, they will have a tax advisor and they will be earning income um, and they will say to that tax advisor, for example, I want you to turn my income into something else, maybe using tax havens um, uh, in order to cut my tax bill so I pay less tax. Um, and that is, um, I think that's the level at which it becomes problematic. I think ordinary people, if they're, um, you know, if they're just buying something from a large multinational, I mean, they may prefer to buy it from a local, you know, company or, or local farmers or whatever, and, that, and, that, and that's great. But, but I think um, it's impossible to stop people from using tax havens because they're everywhere. What does double taxation mean and how does it affect hard-working tax-abiding citizens? Double taxation is about the international tax system. So if a company in one country, say in Germany, invests in another country, say in Indonesia, um, and it generates income from that investment, which country is going to tax that income? Is it Indonesia or is it Germany? Well, um, if there were no agreements between Germany and Indonesia or international agreements, then both of them would try and tax it and the company would kind of be taxed twice and um, they would say that is unfair. Um, and it may well be unfair. It, what happens then is companies say, OK, we're going to avoid that. Um, either if there isn't an agreement between Germany and Indonesia, we're going to use tax havens and we're going to escape. Um, you know, so it won't be a German company investing directly in Indonesia. It'll be a kind of indirect um, investment. And using that structure, using sort of fairly complex legal mechanisms, you can avoid that double taxation. Um, and that in itself is not problematic. The problem is that when you use those mechanisms, very often you get what's called double non-taxation. In other words, it's not being taxed either in Germany or in Indonesia. And that's where the, that's where the problems set in. So often these structures that are helping companies avoid something perfectly legitimate also create the possibility to, um, to do something um, much more problematic for society. Could you talk about the costs, including opportunity costs, that tax havens have on our social system? Nearly always um, it is the wealthiest people who use tax havens. Um, sometimes it's pension funds and you know you have ordinary people in using pension funds, but even then the majority of people who have fi private pension fund assets are wealthier people. So it's the wealthier sections of society that tend to use tax havens. And they use tax havens either to escape tax or to achieve secrecy or to escape some regulations they don't like, some local rules. Um, so what you have sort of generically, this whole system um, inevitably creates an escape route for the richest section of society um, from laws and rules that they don't like. Whereas everybody else who's just behaving normally, who's not, doesn't have the same opportunity to use tax havens. Um, is having to obey those rules, is having to pay those taxes. Um, so, the, the, you know, the effect is, is economic. Um, it increases inequality, of course, because if you have, you know, richer people um, escaping tax or whatever, and poorer people having to pay, pay those taxes, that will in increase inequality. Um, it will create um, bigger, you know, the big will become bigger, the more the richer will become richer, the big multinationals will become more powerful, monopolies, um, things like that will become stronger, corrupting markets. This is a whole corruption of the sort of economic system. It is not, um, it is not even the sort of, you know, standard defenses of capitalist, capitalism do not defend this system because it is, it really is corrupting markets. But it is also by providing an escape route for the richest and most powerful sections of society, um, it is undermining democracy because people see this happening. People know it. You know, they may not understand the complexities, but they will feel it in their guts that these people are getting away with it. These people are going and doing things that we can't do and laughing at us. And that is really, really dangerous for democracy. And, you know, we've seen in the last um, four or five years a really rapid rise in extremism. And that's f for many reasons. But this really contributes to that, this sense of injustice, this sense of our elites are laughing at us and getting away with stuff um, is a huge contribution to all these terrible things that we're seeing going on today. You know, Trump and Brexit and all this kind of stuff. Um, tax havens play an important role, have played an important role in feeding these flames. And who knows where this is going to go. 
how do you view this issue in terms of political ideology? Does it align more with the left in terms of economic justice or more with the right wing in terms of having more fairer competition in markets? One of the things that immediately attracted to me to this area, to this issue, was that um, I do not see the, the, the fight against tax havens as a leftist fight. This is not a left-right fight. This is about the corruption of markets. This is about crime. This is about democracy. You know, tax havens are undermining democracy. They are increasing criminality. They are undermining the integrity of markets. Um, I think nearly everybody on the left and half of the people on the right can accept that. I think there's a whole bunch of people on the right who are, you might call, um, less reasonable. I think the people who are most directly benefiting from the system and have been building the system, um, I think generally will have a very hard ideological position that maybe is hard to shift. But I think you can you can build really strong coalitions with this between, you know, uh, people who might consider themselves on the right and vote for you know the CDU or the Conservative Party or um, you know the Republican Party in the in the U.S. But I think lots of these people. When you present these arguments about tax havens, saying, look at this, this is not how capitalism is supposed to work, it's not how democracy is supposed to work, it's not how, um, how we fight crime, it's a threat to national security, um, you get a lot of sympathy. And um, there's, you know, for example, in the United States at the moment, there's a lot of people in the national security community who generally are pretty right-wing people who are fighting very hard against all this shell company stuff because they see it's a very dangerous thing. You know, malign actors coming into their system, buying up who knows what. Um, so this is not a left-right issue. This is a, an issue we all can embrace. And what this is, I think, if you want to put it in left-right terms, um, it's more, you know, you, it, it is more of a fight of capital against society. Maybe that's another way of, a way you could see it. So I think, you need to distinguish between capital and markets. I think most people, many people I do, accept that markets pl can play a very positive role. There are many problems with markets, but markets have brought a lot of good things. And uh, the problem is to fix this system so that markets can operate fairly and freely and in the interests of society. And there have been times in history when more or less that was the case in many countries. Um, and that is, some, that is some, something to aim for. During the beginning phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw many governments struggle to provide basic medical protective gear and equipment to key health professionals and patients. Now, as we begin to ease the lockdown, economic problems are surfacing due to the massive tax gaps that governments are facing throughout Europe. The Tagesschau, Germany's leading daily news segment, for example, recently reported that Germany will have a tax gap of 81 billion euros without even looking at tackling tax havens as a possible option to cover this gap. Why do you think leading media outlets and even political figures did not bring up tax havens when the crisis began? And why does this continue to be the case even as we start to see the extent of the economic costs of this crisis? The crisis is going to impose huge costs um, uh, and it will generate, you know, a bigger tax gap. I think we need to distinguish, though, between a tax gap. Um, what I understand as a tax gap is the difference between what taxes should be paid and what taxes are actually paid. People escaping or not paying or whatever for legal or other reasons. Um, that's different from a budget deficit. A budget deficit is the gap between what a government spends and what a government takes in in taxes. Um, and first of all, budget deficits. In Germany, there's this crazy mentality called black zero, which holds that uh, governments must always um, spend only what they take in in tax revenues. It, it, it's a sort of societal consensus. It's very strong in Germany. It does exist in other countries, but most other economists around the world say this is crazy, this is a ridiculous thing, this is an antiquated economic theory based on the idea that an economy is, is you know, um, a corn economy where, you know, if you don't have, um, you know, where uh, governments, too much government spending will kind of take away resources from the rest of the economy. It's, it's a complete nonsense, but it's so widely believed in Germany. Um, so first of all, the correct response to this crisis now is for governments to borrow money. Um, because the alternative, if you've got to have revenues matching spending, 
um, revenues are going to go right down with this crisis. That means spending has got to go right down, and that will that will lead to recession and um, terrible um, spending decisions being made and schools being closed and you know awful stuff. So that gap, the budget deficit, Germany has to change its mentality. It has to start thinking, yes, we can borrow. Um, and uh, interest rates are incredibly no low now. You can borrow to invest, to invest in infrastructure, to invest in education, things that will make the economy more, more productive. Having said that, it is essential for Germany to also, in all countries, to raise tax revenues where possible. In this moment of crisis, there's businesses about to go bust. Um, we should not be raising, you know, taking huge tax chunks out of businesses that are about to go vulnerable businesses um, away from people who have, you know, who are earning almost nothing, who've lost their jobs. We should be um, supporting these people. We shouldn't be taxing those. But there is a large group of people and companies that are very strong, remain strong in this crisis. Some of them have become even stronger, like Amazon or Zoom. Um, that have done very well out of this crisis. So we need to, we need to now tax these strong and wealth, wealthy individuals and strong companies at much higher rates than before. Effectively, we need to take much more tax from these, these um, companies and individuals um, than we were doing before to compensate in some way for the loss of um, tax revenues from other parts of the economy and for the increases in spending that we're now seeing. So we do need a much, much more progressive tax system. Um, and we need, to design, we need to redesign our tax system so that um, taxes are levied from the strongest members of society, um, so that the strong support the weak effectively. And that has been a matter, you know, the, the issue of how much to do that has always been a matter of political debate, but now it's suddenly come into sharp focus and we need to now really start looking at the ways wealth taxes and excess profits taxes on corporations, um, a whole range of other taxes that raise as much revenue as we can from the strongest members of society um, to help mitigate the damage that we're seeing from this crisis. What do you make of the argument, usually from the right wing, that this money is better off stored in tax havens because if it were returned, we may see a dramatic increase in the supply of money which could lead to a runaway inflation. There are a lot of crazy crackpot theories out there um, that, uh, you know, tax havens are good for one reason or another. They help, you know, entrepreneurs increase, you know, they're the, there's a very strong current that, you know, rich people are the wealth creators and um, everybody else should just be grateful for everything they do and we should give them, you know, tax cuts and so on to help them create more wealth. And these kinds of theories are very, are very popular. Um, uh, but of course, you know, wh where does that kind of argument stop? You know, if the wealth take, if the wealth creators need more tax cuts, well, why not cut their taxes down to zero? You know, why not give them negative tax rates for every income they earn, give them, you know, every dollar they earn, give them two dollars, give them five dollars, you know, where does this logic stop? Um, of course it's insane, I mean not just for democratic reasons but there's endless, you know, economic knowledge now that this, you know, the more inequality you have, the worse your long-term economic growth. So um, this kind of thinking just damages prosperity. These theories about inflation, I think again there's this kind of mania, there's this societal kind of consensus it's widespread in the media that inflation is a threat it's just around the corner we need to worry about inflation you know german government bonds are earning negative in interest rates inflation is near zero we should be worrying about inflation going lower and lower because what happens with that is when interest rates are so low asset prices the prices of apartments or yachts or whatever it is the rich people have go up and up and up they get they get richer we need to find ways to increase inflation that's what is needed now um, not you know there's obviously a question of balance we don't want it to go too far but inflation is too low right now and we need to we need to spend and we need to do you know anything that risks reducing inflation even even lower below zero um, you know we had oil prices going negative the other day um, all of this stuff is profoundly damaging profoundly dangerous um, and will have long-lasting effects do tax havens have any consequences for democratic systems? Tax havens, um, because they generally allow 
the users of tax havens, which is the wealthiest and most powerful individuals, allow them to escape taxes, to escape rules, to escape laws, um, it undermines the foundation of democracy, that the idea that you know every, one person, one vote, one person um, is treated before the law as equal to another person. Well, this system, the wealthy are not equal. They're, they're, it, it makes them somehow superior. You know, they can escape these laws. Um, we have to submit to them. Billionaires don't. They can use their armies of tax advisors and, and, and wealth managers to uh, play the game and, and escape the law and escape the rules. And if there's anything more damaging to democracy, I can't think what it is. What, if anything, are governments or international institutions such as the EU doing about tax havens? What are the latest developments regarding this issue? I guess until the last global financial crisis 10 years ago, I would say governments weren't doing very much about it. There were a few initiatives, international initiatives, to try and crack down on tax havens. Governments would do things like have penalties for people who didn't declare their income, um, but there was no mechanism for them to find out, you know, if, if I put my money in a tax haven, there were basically no mechanism for my government to find out that I had done that. You know, the money was gone and um, I was laughing. After the last global financial crisis, a couple of things happened. Um, first of all, there was, uh, you know, particularly, you know, a bunch of people in the, you know, the Tax Justice Network and others put together this new kind of analysis of crack tax havens showing how important it was and how dangerous it was. And that started to become widely accepted. But more importantly, with the global financial crisis, you had governments suddenly seeing massive public anger over bankers getting away with it again and inequality and all this sort of stuff. It all sort of built up the last, the previous global financial crisis. And governments realizing they had a, a huge deficits, huge losses of tax revenues because of the crisis and having to find new sources of revenue. And of course, with all that public anger and the need to find new sources of revenue, they could see inequality was getting out of control. There's a pot of money there, the wealthiest people, um, not just in tax havens, but, but certainly in tax havens. Um, and they needed to start trying to tax, tackle that problem. So uh, an initiative, a couple of initiatives um, really got underway, um, led by the OECD, which is the Club of Rich Countries, um, which is a very powerful grouping. And they started setting up two things. One is a, a, a global sort of information sharing mechanism, including some of the world's most important tax havens, Switzerland, um, Cayman Islands, and so on, um, where governments agreed to start allowing information to be shared between each other so that if a rich person in one country has got some, you know, bank accounts in another country, information will come back to that country's government so that they could tax it. So the OECD set up this system called the Common Reporting Standards, and there's a couple of other related ones linked to money laundering and things like that. Um, uh, that started producing some results, and we've had some progress. Um, of course, it's a complicated thing, and there's a lot of loopholes, and um, a lot of people still escaping. But the sense of impunity that there was before, uh, that people could just put their money in cat tax haven, no one will ever find out, that's kind of gone now. Um, you also have things like the Panama Papers, these leaks of information, Luxembourg leaks, where people thought their information was safe, but it's gone out to, you know, people have smuggled it out in little discs and given it to the world's media. And you've got all, the, all sorts of people realizing that their information maybe isn't as safe as they thought it was. So there's a lot more kind of, um, you know, resistance, a fear of using tax havens among, among the rich than there, than there was. So these pressures have kind of um, contained the problem to some degree. But on the other hand, you've had rising inequality, a lot more wealth being kind of extracted into the pockets of, you know, a relatively small class of people. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot more money and so the system has, you know, despite the pressures, in, in, in a sense, the system has continued to grow a bit. Um, so it is still a huge, huge problem. And it's kind of shape, shifted shape because some jurisdictions have been more compliant with this. Um, at the same time, you have had 
another, syst another system also led by the OECD, Club of Rich Countries, to um, stop multinationals playing all these games to escape tax. And again, um, there has been some progress here and countries have agreed to change rules in many respects, but also that's, that system is full of loopholes. Um, and so, you know, there has been some progress since the last global financial crisis. Now we are in the middle of the pandemic. I think all of these systems are being reappraised and the possibility of, the political possibility of, of doing much more serious things are now coming into view. Um, and so I think we are in, we are in an interesting time. Uh, you know, there has been, since the last global financial crisis, a sort of rightward shift of governments, um, I would say, and that has been very problematic for tackling tax havens. Um, I think the US government has not really improved matters. That's hardly surprising. Donald Trump um, is not um, a fan of cracking down on tax havens. His solution has been more to sort of cut taxes, and, and that's kind of been a big part of the answer for, for people like that. Um, uh, I wrote a story about Donald Trump a while ago, and um, I, I, uh, I had to, you know, my, my task was to find out if he was using tax havens. And um, I got an interview with him, and he said, uh, I don't use tax havens because I can get everything I need in the United States. And um, uh, I was not able to identify any major tax haven use by him. There were little bits and pieces here and there. Um, but I think he's probably right, and people, tax experts I spoke to, agree that he was probably right that because there's so many possibilities for people like him to completely escape paying taxes um, if they do it in the right way particularly people in the real estate business there are so many loopholes that there's so much kind of ability um, among the rich to do stuff at home that they don't really need to use use tax havens so i think we need to see this the tax haven problem in a kind of bigger context there's so much we can do at do at home to sort of close these loopholes. So it's an interesting question, where are we gonna go now? There's, there's now, like with the previous global financial crisis, huge popular anger and a lot of calls, a lot of um, big calls coming for really progressive change. Let's really tax the wealthy, let's restrict monopolies, let's, um, all this kind of stuff that needs to be done. And the difference now is that at the last crisis, the whole world was governed by this kind of consensus that we need, you know, we need to tax cuts we need to cut taxes to support the, the wealthy and the wealth creators and everything will trickle down. And, and um, everybody kind of, there, there was no real alternatives except from the fringes. Um, people who were, um, is, you know, who had very radical views were kind of marginalized. Nobody was really listening to them. Um, and so when the crisis hit, there weren't really any ideas lying around for governments to take on. And um, they would have been regarded as crazy um, even though the, a lot of these ideas were not crazy, but they would have been regarded as crazy at that time. In the period since then, a lot of these once crazy ideas have now become much more widely accepted and even mainstream. I mean, from the point of view of the Tax Justice Network, back in 2003, there were, there were some policies that we proposed um, which uh, were people just said this is ridiculous nobody's ever going to do this um, it's insane um, uh, one called country by country reporting which is about getting multinationals to be more transparent and say what they do in every country where they do business um, the automatic sharing of information across borders to help governments identify you know what their richest taxpayers are doing um, um, and beneficial ownership, you know, getting companies to have registries of who owns what and making it public. All of these three things, which we were told was insane at the time, are now basically um, widely accepted mainstream um, ideas that have been accepted by many governments. Many governments are actually implementing these ideas um, very imperfectly. I mean, of course, with many problems and loopholes and gaps and stuff, but but what was crazy is now accepted. And I think now that we are in a situation in contrast to then, where the ideas are there and they are acceptable. So it is possible that all this popular anger will lead to a, a further rightward shift and um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the role that Facebook plays in sewing up misinformation and all this kind of stuff could lead us in one direction. But the other more exciting possibilities is that there's a lot of people who want to go in the other direction and properly re-energize um, re democracy and um, stop the elites getting away with um, uh, rigging the game, rigging the markets, rigging the rules. And um, so I think we're at a very interesting time and I, I don't want to predict which way we're going, but I do feel in the sort of area that I work, there's a huge amount of energy favoring the more exciting um, possibilities. What do you think of the initiative called Association for the Taxation of Financial Transactions and for Citizens Action, also known as ATAC, that advocates for financial transaction tax? Could this also be part of the solution? ATTAC um, is an organization that I used to regard as being on the fringes and I remember hearing some of their ideas and thinking that's crazy and not really paying a huge amount of attention to. Um, I think some of those ideas have become really mainstream um, and widely accepted and that's part of this whole process that, that we've been going through. Um, one, you know, the core idea of the financial transactions tax, um, a, little, a little tax on every financial transaction. Um, and it's a very good idea and there's a lot of support for it now even among many mainstream commentators. Um, one of the difficulties with it is that so much of the financial sector these days, particularly in the United Kingdom, um, where it is about transactions, huge volumes of trans transactions. Sometimes it's algorithms and machines buying and selling stuff, you know, in hundredths of a second, you know, um, all this kind of stuff is happening. And if you put a little tax on each one of these millions and millions of transactions, um, it could add, add up to a huge amount of money, but it would kill these markets. Um, now, in my view, a lot of this stuff that we're seeing, these very high volume transaction things, um, are harmful to society. They, you know, they generate a lot of wealth for the people who own the algorithms and the machines or doing all this trading. Um, and a lot of people see that and they see all this wealth and they think, oh, these are rich people, they're good, good for my country, you know, we like having all this wealth around. But in fact, um, the very idea, the original idea, um, James Tobin, um, who proposed putting sand in the wheels of this kind of stuff is the term he used, um, because these wheels going around making money for um, uh, certain people, this money is not created, it's not wealth creation, it's not good stuff that helps an economy grow, it is extraction, it is taking money away from other people through very sophisticated mechanisms. And if you can stop this wealth, um, this kind of um, wealth extraction from other parts of the economy, from other people, you can actually make your country better off. So I think um, you know, there are people who will say, oh, we can't do this because it will kill these markets. And there would certainly be a huge amount of financial disruption. But um, in many senses, that is the point. You do want to kill these particular markets because they're harmful, they're harming your society. And so um, I think one of the biggest parts of the battle is to persuade people that certain markets are harmful. Because I think so many people just think, I see a lot of money being made over there, that must be good, it, you know, it's in my country and I'll somehow, you know, they'll pay taxes and that'll be good for, good for me. I don't think people get beyond that to a much more sophisticated understanding that some of these activities um, are harming them. What actions do you propose that governments and multilateral institutions should undertake in order to effectively address these issues? There's no magic, magic bullet that will tackle these problems because this is the global economy. This is, you know, this affects pretty much everything. Everything, all businesses are somehow involved in all these kinds of things and the tax system and the financial regulatory system and, and so on. Um, for me, um, I, my last book uh, was called The Finance Curse and this was based on the sort of paradox, paradoxical idea that too much finance can make you poorer. So what's happening in our economies is what um, academics call financialization. So you're getting a lot of players. Um, it's not just banks, but it's private equity firms, it's hedge funds, um, and various kind of esoteric players getting involved in our economy, in the real economy, in agriculture, in manufacturing, in you know the creative industries, in water provision, 
everywhere you look, particularly in Britain, my country, um, but also in Germany to a certain degree, they are kind of looking at the economy as a resource to be milked. Um, financial sector players are seeing opportunities and so a private equity firm for example will buy up a company and you know the heroic story they tell as well we'll buy it up it's not working very well we'll make it work better and sell it for a profit the real story is they look take that company they buy it they identify all the different stakeholders of that company and then they'll kind of extract from all those stakeholders so this company has not sent, not put its financial affairs through tax havens enough. So let's set up a structure so that it can escape paying tax, so milking money from the taxpayers. This company is paying its workers too much, or it's got too many work employees, or the pensions are too generous. So let's do something. You know, we'll sack some employers, we'll break the unions, we'll we'll uh, you know uh, play with its pension pot. Um, it's suppliers, um, they're getting too generous terms, let's crush them. Um, and all of these things kind of extract money and make deliver huge profits to the actual financial players who are involved in this sort of stuff. Um, and they add debt, they make the company borrow a lot of money and they make it more fragile. So all of this stuff is harming the real economy, but these people are getting incredibly wealthy um, from these kinds of games, this kind of financial engineering. Um, and again, there is this sense in, in Britain, certainly, less so in Germany, but there is, there is a certain sense that the richest people are the wealth creators. Whereas these kinds of players um, are the opposite. It's kind of like, for me, it's like negative investment. It's harmful investment. You know, you see these investors coming in, um, but this stuff is really genuinely harmful. And so we need to really stop this kind of activity and try and focus what it, on what the real economy, you know, what, uh, you know, real business is doing and focus on that and make sure that works okay. Make sure the tax system works okay, but don't allow these predators to come in and sort of financially engineer our economies. And, and that's happening in increasingly in lots of countries around the world. I think United Kingdom, the United States is where it's strongest, but it's coming to Germany. Um, it's coming to poor countries. This stuff is happening in Africa. Um, financial players going in and looking for very high returns. You know, say so we're going to earn 30% returns a year by going into Africa. And you know, this may sound great, but it's going to end up with these countries being saddled with enormous debts to be paid off for years, years to come. So this is happening all around the world economy. And I think that's um, looking, you know, understanding the dangers of the financial sector um, is needs to happen and, and that sort of consciousness needs to raise for people to start tackling it properly and not to see it as a kind of you know a wealth creation mechanism but to sort of shrink it down to the size where it's providing the useful services that we need you know getting money out from an ATM or or saving and investing in small businesses whatever all this sort of stuff um, that that um, you know economies need I think we need to move away from that and uh, we, we need to we need to focus on that and move away from the um, from the much more kind of um, profitable um, but dangerous activities that is increasingly happening, this kind of financialization, this financial engineering of the economy that we're seeing. What solutions can individuals pursue in order to tackle these problems if their governments fail to respond? That's a very um, important question. You know, what can I do personally to tackle this sort of stuff? And um, I think the answer is not, um, I think, you know, changing my consumer behavior is one possibility and it can help, you know, I, I personally don't shop on Amazon. I hate, I hate Amazon because it's just, you know, it's a monopoly. It's basically a monopoly and it's tyrannizing, you know, it's workforce. And so, but I don't think that personal behavioral changes is going to really get us to where we need to be. I think political change has to be the answer. So. And I also think that, um, this is my personal opinion, I think it is possible to engage with people on the other side, um, what you might call the enemy, people who are defending what you might call capital or whatever you want to call it, um, against society, against people, defending tax havens, whatever. I think it is possible to engage people on a human level. Um, this is not for everyone, but I think you can. 
Um, I was just looking, this morning I was looking at a press release from a, a law firm that was saying, in this pandemic, governments are taking these emergency measures and these emergency measures are damaging investors. And here's how we can help you sue those governments to protect your investments, you know. And that underneath that press release, it had a list of, of the lawyers sort of, you know, here, we can help you. Um, why not write an email to one of these lawyers very respectfully, um, not being abusive or anything like that, just saying, you know, in, but engaging on a human level saying, you know, I've got a family, I've got children, I'm worried about inequality and I see you're trying to do this. Um, do you not worry about this stuff? You know, this kind of thing, I think, um, um, is one possibility. And of course, voting, obviously, that is um, a very important solution to that, to, 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 to this problem. But, you know, if you can engage with political representatives on some level, on some human personal level, that would also be very beneficial because I think people do respond to that. I'm quite skeptical of personal behavioral change. It helps, but not enough. Um, I don't believe that Twitter and Facebook are the answer. It's so easy to sit there and click and, you know, debate with people and express your opinions, share things. It, it can help, but also, you know, particularly Facebook is a really problematic um, uh, thing. It's dividing us, it's subverting democracy. So I think the answer, you know, more direct political confrontation, go on a protest, write letters to your political representative, engage, you know, if you've got a topic you're interested in and you see somebody, for example, a lawyer or a banker or someone doing something, um, you know, in a very respectful way, if you can contact them and engage on a human level and, and say this sort of stuff is, you know, it's bothering me and I'm worried about my children's future and this sort of thing, um, uh, see what happens. But I think things are so serious now that we can't just little measures of just, uh, you know, social media and stuff. It's not enough. It's not enough. We've really got to start, um, start fighting against this stuff um, uh, with a view to reducing this horrendous inequality that we're seeing in the world today.